and welcome to KBTV, the Kennington Bioscope Silent Film Group's online production. And we are pleased indeed to see you back with us and fresh greetings to you if you're joining us for the first time. Our YouTube channel has now clocked up over 1,000 subscribers. So thank you all so much to those who have signed up so far for free from all around the world and also to those who have kindly donated to show your appreciation for this past year's worth of our online broadcasts and to help towards our future programming. All donations gratefully received via our Kennington Bioscope coffee page, the link to which you'll find in the drop box below. Now, don't forget that you can also chat live with other viewers from around the globe during this transmission in the YouTube chat box hosted graciously by Todd Higginson, where you can either just say hello, leave your comments or perhaps pose a question. We certainly trust that we find you on this occasion in fine fettle and occasion really is a fitting word as we are absolutely delighted to bring you another very special collaborative show 
this time in conjunction with our friends at the Cinema Museum, the extraordinary venue and entity which is responsible for our particular group's existence, seeing as the Bioscope began back in 2013 as a fundraising venture for this special custodian and collection of all things cinema. Tonight's event is certainly one which, if it were not for the continuing COVID situation of the last year, would have been held in the remarkable and lofty space of the former chapel of the Lambeth Workhouse, located in the Master's House, Dugard Way, Kennington, which acts now as the main exhibition room at the museum for screenings, live music, theatrical runs, panel discussions and so much more. A place which receives no public funding or financial COVID relief and whose future is still uncertain. So please, if you can, send a donation their way and or sign their petition to show your support. This evening, we are providing the platform for a very special presentation, marking the centenary of the passing of pioneering British inventor, photographer and motion picture innovator, William Freeze Green, who left us on the 5th of May 1921, exactly 100 years ago to the day of this broadcast. And here to discuss the life and legacy of Freeze Green, we have a superb panel of experts consisting of film scholar, researcher and writer, Professor Ian Christie, researcher and writer on the history of audiovisual media and technology, Stephen Herbert, and film director, writer and Freeze Green deep dive researcher, Peter Demankovitz, to whom we would like to extend our hearty congratulations on his recent news of having been awarded the funding to commence his PhD studies on Freeze Green starting this September. Well done to you, Peter, and our very best wishes for that particular journey. To chair this discussion by a fantastic phalanx of early film and Freeze Green experts, I will be handing over to a trustee of the Cinema Museum, Nick Hiley, who will be chairing this panel. So many thanks to you, Nick, and to all of the participants, to Todd for producing the live stream and the Cinema Museum volunteers for promoting the show. I'm looking forward to enjoying all the valuable contributions which will follow. And so I hand over now to Nick, who will guide us through tonight's event. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Michelle, for that. Um, I'm Nick Hiley. I'm one of the trustees of the Cinema Museum, and we're very pleased to join with Kennington Bioscope for this discussion event about uh, the film pioneer William Freeze Green. And we're very lucky to have uh, three eminent speakers about William Freeze Green tonight. Um, Peter Demankovic, who's a, a film director, a writer, and a, a researcher into the life of Freeze Green who has a, a very interesting blog, which you can find online about Freeze Green. And also Stephen Herbert, who's a researcher and writer on the history of audiovisual media and technology, uh, an acknowledged expert in image projection of all sorts, whose understanding of the, the technical context of Freeze Green's work, I think is second to none, and he'll be speaking tonight. And also Professor Ian Christie from Birkbeck University of London, a film scholar, a researcher, and a writer who's recently published a book, Robert Paul and the Origins of British Cinema. And um, Ian will be contextualizing Freeze Green's career in, in the context of, of uh, early British cinema as a whole. Um, we're gathered together on the centenary of Freeze Green's death. It's rather strange to celebrate somebody's life by commemorating their death. But it, it, paradoxically, Freeze Green's death became a very significant part of his life. He died on the 5th of May, 1921, at a meeting of the British cinema trade, uh, after making what contemporaries described as a powerful plea for unity, after which he, he dropped dead of heart failure. And his death led to a reconsideration of his life 
and it became the climax of the biographical film, The Magic Box, which premiered at the 1951 Festival of Britain. Now we, can, we can't show, for copyright reasons, we can't show on a, on a YouTube stream uh, a clip from the film, but I think if we can look at some stills from that, that um, climax scene of, of his death, if we can put those up. Are we seeing those? Okay. Well, this is um, this is Robert Donat playing uh, William Freeze Green, and at the climax of the film, he makes his speech. Then he returns to his seat, and he falls face down on the ground. He's carried out of the hall and is pronounced dead on the bench outside. And then you have this statement of, uh, of uh, carved in stone of, of his. Um, his, his position as a uh, uh, father of cinematography. And the magic box and the biography on which it was based does champion Freeze Green as the father of film, but it also is this, this kind of exploration of the failure of his life as well, his failure to be recognized, his failure to be commercially successful. And so I think that's something which we're, the three speakers today I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about, which is, this balance between success and failure, and Freeze Green's ability to to uh, to snatch failure from the jaws of success, and and whether we should um, uh, reinstate him in, in the in the pantheon of of heroes of, of early cinema. So I'd like to start off by inviting Peter Demankovic to to talk about Freeze Green and his own research into his life. anybody starts to get a little bit drowsy um, hopefully the glints will keep you awake um, also I'd like to say hello to some freeze greens who I know um, from the chat and also because they told me in advance are here and listening and watching which is great from the great grandchildren and the great great grandchildren of him okay so William freeze green 100 years dead 66 years buried well I guess that is kind of part of the theme of tonight Hopefully it will become clear, especially what Ian's got to say and some of the things I've got to say. So who am I to be talking about this? Well, first of all, I'm a filmmaker. Um, and as a filmmaker, I got curious about Freeze Green. And I got curious because of this. This plaque in Bristol on the Queen's Road outside of W. Freeze Green, the inventor of the moving picture camera, served his apprenticeship as a photographer from 1869 to 1875. And I was looking at it thinking, well, I know a little bit about a moving pictures began. I never heard of this guy. And I started asking around, and fatal mistake. Uh, and I immediately ran into a problem. And here's a problem. I was told there was this bloke called Will Day who knew Freeze Green and you know, was writing history of cinema and he was a big collector, but he was a huge supporter of Freeze Green, said he was the inventor of motion pictures uh, and rather distorted things. But then there was this other guy called Brian Coe who was ultra skeptical about Freeze Green and he was an important person and he was, you know, director of the Kodak Museum and of the Royal Photographic Society and he was a very important person in Momi and he said that Freeze Green basically didn't understand much about anything. Whatever he did that was any good was basically somebody else's idea. He stole other people's ideas, and we shouldn't really pay any attention to him. It was therefore immediately clear to me that I probably shouldn't believe either of these stories that seem to mysteriously not overlap at all on the Venn diagram of freeze greenness. Let's go back to the beginning. William Freeze Green, basically working class kid, mum, the daughter of a farmer, um, dad is a metal worker. He luckily wins a place to Queen Elizabeth Hospital School, known as the Blue Coat School, which is basically a charity school where you could get four years of education from the ages of 10 to 14. And you would be a boarder. So even though his mum and dad were just down the road, he lived there because obviously it would take a weight off your parents' hands. And this is an actual picture from that time of the school. You are basically in Oliver Twist um, and you would get a good education and really harsh treatment for four years after which they would then find you, hopefully, there's a young, young, young Willie Green, that's all he was then, he was just William Green, they will hopefully find you somebody to work for as an apprentice. And what they found for him eventually was to work for Mr. Guttenberg, a photographer, 
just up the road, who was opening up a swanky new place on what was then known as Royal Promenade, now just Queen's Road in Bristol, and needed an apprentice. But actually, uh, Willie Green didn't get on very well with his employer and uh, broke off the apprenticeship about halfway through, which you're not supposed to do. And apparently he was taken to court, but the court sided with the young man and he just went off and did his own thing. Boy, did he do his own thing. Age 19, he had met this uh, Swiss German woman, Helena Fries, was over in Bristol really for her health at the time. She was a few years older than him. He was 19, they got married. Uh, they moved to Bath and they had a kid. And in no time at all, he had a photographic studio. And then he had another, which was this one, which was in his family actually for quite a long time. And something else has happened, as you might be able to see from that card on the right, where his handwritten now says freeze green. So he joined her name to his and added an E at the end for balance, is what he said. And, you know, it was all for everything new. Discovery, revolution, progress, photography by artificial light. Mr. Freeze Green somehow spelled differently here. But anyway, this is 1880. I think the first studio with artificial light in Britain was in 1877 in London, and they had to generate it from their own dynamo. So this was revolutionary stuff in Bath. And there was somebody else who was very, very much into electricity in Bath, and that was John Rudge. He was quite a bit older than Freeze Green, but in a sense, slightly similar. He'd come from a you know fairly humble background. He basically, as far as I can tell, taught himself science by reading books, by studying all the magazines that came out. Uh, he would build things from there. Some were for entertainment, and he would give entertainments, and some of them were useful things, like he built the first X-ray machine that was used in Bath Hospital. So there was something in particular. Well, I should say Rudge himself was a pretty accomplished photographer, so maybe that's what drew them together. There's something that particularly interested Freeze Green, and it was this that he was working on, the Biophantic Lantern. And as you can see, it's this kind of magic lantern, round cake tin sort of looking thing. It's got a series of pictures around the outside. And it's got a kind of shutter. Let's have a look at what it does. I love these old films where people abuse um, museum objects, which you wouldn't be allowed to touch these days. But as you can see, it's a simple thing like a shutter that's closing as the pictures change, what's out of sync, doesn't matter. A funny little triangular thing you see moving, that is actually later appears in the Lumia Cinematograph. And the way it's being turned round is what's known as a Maltese cross type movement, which would be in an awful lot of projectors come the day there were film projectors. So that's an interesting little device. But what would the viewers have seen. Something like that. Rudge <laughs> pulling his own head off, which was taken, I think, from a popular drawn sequence of the time. Some while ago, back in the late 90s, when I was in the Cinematheque Francaise, I had the opportunity to see the original slides, which have you know, been largely blacked out. And under the light, you could see what else was on there. And when I flipped, the image from positive to negative, so the dark bits came out, there is freeze green, um, being the head. <laughs> um, sorry, no, he's being the body, and Rudge is being the separated head. But that wasn't all. Uh, a few years later, Rudge was working on something else. This was like a little four lens machine. Um, so a little bit like a carte de visite that took those pictures that were popular, but these were actually quite small. Each one of those pictures, coincidentally, is actually 35 millimeters across. And you could just kind of mix with this lantern from one to the other. So it would probably look something like... Oh, yeah, yeah. Or, um, yeah. So even though these are very simple, they give quite an illusion of life, don't they? They're kind of like very early gifts. Um, but the dissolving effect makes it seem like there's more there. And this got Freeze Green incredibly excited. And when they showed something like this at a sort of entertainment evening, Freeze Green said about it, the picture showed a girl moving her eyes from side to side. And so sceptical was one old lady who was present that she walked up to the sheet onto which the picture was thrown and insisted on touching the moving eyes. She thought someone must be behind the screen. And he always said that this was the thing that really got him going on the idea of making photography come to life. His business was booming. 
He had places now in a couple in Bath, he had in Bristol, he had down in Plymouth, but he was expanding and London was calling for him. Sorry, London was calling for him. And there he kind of did the same thing again. He opened up a little empire of studios, turned his name into a brand, but he wasn't really there to do photography, truth be told. He didn't pop up at a studio now and again. He was there to continue his education, learn more about science, and gradually join some of these scientific institutions. And that led him into wanting to invent in motion pictures himself. And in 1889, he comes up with this in collaboration with a civil engineer who was not a photographer, but must have helped with designing the whole thing. It is something for taking photographs automatically in a rapid series with a single camera and lens on a strip of film. It doesn't sound like very much. You just go, well, that's just a movie camera, isn't it? Except in the June of 1889, this is quite radical stuff, really. It's not a lot of people in the world who are attempting to take pictures with just one lens and just one camera or just one strip of film. Murray was doing experiments in France, but these weren't written about in Britain yet, and he was only trying to analyze motion. Le Prince was doing things, but entirely in secret. Fries Green was not doing things in secret. Fries Green was all the time making appearances at photographic societies and loved talking about his stuff. So what would this patent be? This is a beautiful replica made through the Race to Cinema project. And there is Stephen handling it. I was astonished when I saw this because I just couldn't believe it was right. But actually, yes, if you look at the patent, this is how big the camera would be, essentially like a Kodak movie camera. Uh, it seems almost crazy that somebody should have been trying to do this quite so early. But that wasn't all, because actually a camera he was having built in the summer of that year, 1889, was a larger machine that could take a bigger roll and it could take twice as many pictures per second. He said it could get up to 10 frames a second. It doesn't sound like much, but most people thought that was all you needed. That was sort of top speed trying to do motion pictures. So let's take a little look at this one. This also is one of the racist cinema replicas taken from all sorts of drawings and pictures. Uh, and you now see a very, very happy little boy getting to actually twiddle the handle of the camera, much as Freeze Green went out and shot his first films on a strip of celluloid with, because at the end of that year, Eastman were finally making something you could shoot on. Has to be said, wasn't really good enough for movie making yet, but it was something that you could run through a camera. Uh, on the right, you can see uh, a frame from material that's held in Paris um, on a negative, something that was shot by the Serpentine. And the other is something that was reproduced in a, in a journal. Um, I don't know where that's shot in London. Happy to hear any ideas. And you can see there are tiny little holes up the edges. And that was how the film was moved, with a, with a ring of pins rather than with actual sprockets. Now, I'm going to digress a moment here because this is exactly what Freeze Green did. In the February of 1890, he was presenting this camera to a photographic society for the first time in Bath. But not that far into talking about the camera, he goes off onto a different subject. Now, the next subject I shall connect with this paper is the ladies. But they are pushing themselves forward in a marked manner. The ordinary view held by the majority of people as to the intellectual power of women as compared with men is not very encouraging to the fair sex. The smaller brain is held to be positive evidence of a smaller mind or of no mind at all. This idea is still cherished by some, though in the face of everything tending to show the opposite, it has taken a long time to convince some that women are truly capable of rising to any position above that of slavery, socially and physically. In my opinion, it won't be long before we shall be convinced of the fact that women, when given the same intellectual advantages and education as men, will prove intellectually equal. And he goes on to talk some more about this and basically say the reason why men don't want women in photographic societies is they, they do better than them. And this is one of the things that intrigues me about Fries Green. And this, this picture from one of his studios, this appears to probably be his sister-in-law, who would be, who certainly at one point was running one of his studios, working there as a photographer, and certainly not the only woman that he trained up 
who was then running her own business. But that's slightly another story. Anyway, British Green and his cameras, he was showing them at the Royal Institution. Must be very happy about that. He was patenting them in Germany and in Switzerland and France and Spain and Canada and Australia. Whew. Great. So what else was going on at this moment? As some of you know, Edison was working on this. Well, in fact, really, a guy called William Dixon was working on this for Edison. What were they doing in 1889? Well, start of the year, they were still plugging away at an idea that Edison had, which was to try and record micro photographs on a cylinder. But bearing in mind that even today, trying to record micro photographs on a cylinder would be fairly challenging. Uh, what we would have had then is essentially just little blobs. And that was about the best that they could do. On the other side, this is an idea for something, which is now you can see, aha, strip of film, got some holes in it. This is the very end of 1889 after Edison has been to France and met Marais, who has been working with a strip of film. But by now, Fries Green has one or two cameras in his hands. Not only that, beginning of 1890, he writes to Edison very excitedly, telling him about what he's up to. They ask him to send some details. He does. Whether they arrived or not is unclear. And it, to be honest, is moot, because April of, 18, of 1890, it's all published in the Scientific American in fact, in an edition where the feature is about Edison himself. A lot of details of the camera. How much influence this did or did not have? Well, that's entirely debatable. But I'll tell you one thing. This is something that Dixon wrote to Edison after Freeze Green died in a rather angry letter. How is it that Freeze Green, when he wrote to you in 1890, you showed me the letter, described what he was doing, and you had to write to say that you'd already secured the whole thing in 1888? which obviously he had not done anything remotely of the sort. They didn't even have a film camera working at that moment. Meanwhile, Freeze Green jumped straight into working with somebody else, Frederick Varley, another engineer who patented this stereoscopic camera, 3D camera. Um, how much was Freeze Green, how much was Varley? A bit hard to say. Freeze Green paid for it and did things with it. Uh, it was Varley's patent. It was kind of a bit off to the side, really. I'm going to show you this tiny little animation I've done, first time I've showed it, of a series of three frames. As you can see, very big gaps between it. They didn't know how they were going to show 3D to anybody. Nobody worked that out for quite a long time. Um, anyway, there you go. That was another experiment. Come the beginning of 1891, though, Free Screen has a really bad 24 hours. He's back at the Royal Institution showing his latest cameras. But what he's not telling anybody, I'm reasonably sure, is at 12 o'clock the following day, all of his household belongings are up for auction. He's held onto his cameras by paying somebody off, but everything else is being sold because he is completely broke. He has blown everything he earned from his chain of photographic studios on inventing and he's gone spectacularly bankrupt. And now, literally, nobody wants to know him. The thing that saves his neck is that his wife, Helena, had enough resources to set up a new studio in her own name and employ him as her manager or working there for 2,002 shillings a week, pretty much minimum wage. But at least he had a workshop in the basement. And somehow he still kept on doing stuff with moving pictures. I don't even understand how he had the resources to, or he's probably going to get anyone to build anything for him, I wouldn't have thought. And now he's punching holes in the side of the film. And also, he's adopted a different frame format, more like what you'd recognize as good old-fashioned academy ratio. Now, there is some of this material. It's, again, the Cinematheque Francaise. Uh, they preserved it after I uh, first saw it back in the 90s. And uh, I, I saw it projected once, but it's only ever been projected a handful of times. And unfortunately, it's not online. So all I can show you is a reconstruction I've done from very inferior materials, just some pictures I took on a light box when I was there of the negatives, twiddled around with a bit. As you can see, it's a slow frame rate, very slow frame rate. But this is right outside 39 Kings Road, where he had his studio. And if you stand there today, you'll see pretty much the same thing, minus the awnings. Um, and there are several accounts, people seeing things projected in that basement workshop. And one of them, woman actually 
talks about how she and her workmates who were there believed he was playing a trick on them because they could see the street outside and they said it was done with mirrors. But this might have been what they were looking at. And if you do look at the original stuff, you can see you can just make out that boy is selling the Times and even just enough to see it's the weekly edition. So we know this is a Saturday. Sadly, not which Saturday, but probably somewhere around the middle of 1891. Skipping forward very, very quickly now. 1895, Bert Akers and Robert Paul are working together. That's a whole other story. But they have a camera with which the first 35 millimeter films in Britain are shot, including one of the Derby. You see there on the right. If you want to know more what I think about that, I did a talk called Whatever Happened at Clavelli Cottage, which is on the Free Screen YouTube channel. But I think it had something to do with Free Screen. What definitely did have something to do with Free Screen was that he worked with a young engineer called John Prestwich, whose dad was a mate of Free Screen, who so was a photographer. And young Prestwich wanted to get into the burgeoning moving picture business. And uh, they worked together on a patent, which led to these things. And one was a camera which was one of the early affordable cameras you could buy to go out and shoot films on. And the thing on the right is an unusual twin lens projector, the idea of which was to avoid flicker. So you'd always have one frame showing at any moment. Very complicated to print, though. It was done. Things were printed, but obviously a very complicated system. So everybody just had to put up with flicker. I'm going to just lunge forward now. There's so much more I could say about his life, about inventing an airship, about being one of the first people to come up with a feasible system of photo typesetting and selling it, all sorts of other things. But he spent quite a lot of the latter part of his life working on trying to capture color. And after his death, his son, Claude, who would go on to be a very respected cinematographer, um, carried directly on his father's work and improved on it. And most famously shot this series of films called The Open Road, a travelogue of Britain, um, which I tried to Interest Channel 4 in doing something with in the 90s. They didn't, but luckily the BBC about a decade later woke up that it was something really interesting. And the British Film Institute figured out how to recreate the colour because the colour you could only really see in projection. But I won't go into all the technical details of that. So, 1921. Freeze Green really is a forgotten man by now. He's gone through a He's gone through good times, bad times, but really now through the war, he's gone through terrible times. Uh, the family had to really fall on charity when Will Day saved them, more or less, by raising money through, within the film industry for the family. But his wife left him, kind of understandably, at that point in time. He's still chipping away. He's still working on patents. When he decides fatefully to go to the meeting that Nick was talking about, and suddenly... He goes from being the forgotten man to being the very much remembered man. And they have this extraordinary, huge funeral for him. And uh, I've seen this. So amateur pushes that were shot in the street. And the streets are absolutely packed with people. It's, it's crazy. It's like, like royalty or something. And yet a week before, literally, if you said William Freeze Green, far a few old timers in the industry, don't imagine anybody would have known who he was. And this is the funeral cortege going through Highgate Cemetery to where he was buried. As you can see, it's a fair-sized affair. A lot of important people in the film industry were there and just lots of curious onlookers who maybe spot them later, like hiding behind gravestones and things. And this extraordinary display of a projector made out of flowers with a screen made out of flowers with the end in purple. Anyway, here's what Theodore Brown, who was somebody who knew Freeze Green over many years, wrote about him. In the passing of Mr. Green, I mourn the loss of a personal friend and a kindred spirit whose optimism was always a tonic and in whose presence one could take a delight. Generous hearted almost to a fault, he benefited others at the expense of temporal discomfort to himself. Yet he must have often tasted those sweet wines of pleasure, unutterable in speech and equally inexpressible in words that come at times to every true inventor. And if you watch now, you will see on the right, that is Will Day with his top hat next to Claude Freeze Green and his wife, Chrissy. And behind, I think, that is Graham and Kenneth, the other two oldest sons. So back to the problem. I, the Venn diagram that doesn't overlap. And what are we really to do? 
Because on the one hand, you've ended up with this film, Robert Donat in it. And look, he's using the wrong camera. You know, you know now that's the wrong camera. That's not the camera he was using, but there it is in the film. And over here, we've got Brian Coe, and he's the curator of the Kodak Museum. Kodak got a whole team of people there. So surely, surely he must be the one that's right. But in all honesty, as, as I've gone past the years investigating this, I, I find very little that's believable in what he wrote. There's almost perhaps more that's true in the film. At least that's probably what William Fries Green was like, more or less, as a person. So what am I supposed to do about this? Well, what I'm actually doing about it is, come the end of September, I'm starting a PhD about William Fries Green and what he did, and I'm going to be running some tests with those replica cameras and just see what comes out of it. Um, not trying to make him an angel or a devil or a hero or a villain. Get past the myth and the anti-myth. And if you want to know a little bit more, there's a long interview that I did with Bristol Ideas where I talk a lot more about him and Claude and the magic box. And if you, if that hasn't bored you enough, you can find my blog, which is freezegreen.com. And I think that's more than enough from me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, people. I've been I've been scribbling a lot of notes here, although I think uh, the ones at the end are all about the funeral that I'm planning for myself now that I've seen such a, a wonderful send off that um, the freeze green got. I should say that if members of the viewing audience want to put questions to the speakers, then please put them in the comments on the YouTube feed and I will try to pick them up at the end and we'll have a discussion of all the speakers at the end and I'll, I'll try to drop those questions in. Well, Peter did mention the, the, the Race to Cinema project and, and the and Freeze Green's um, cameras and that's something which uh, our next speaker, Stephen Herbert, is an expert in and um, I'm sure that he has a lot to say on that subject, so we can go over then to, to Stephen. Hello folks, I'm very pleased to be here this evening. Hope you can hear me okay. Um, I first became aware of William Freeze Green, it must have been in the 1960s, I don't remember exactly when, but I first saw the magic box uh, more than 50 years ago. And uh, it's uh, not unusual for people to have their favourite scenes from this movie. And one of them is usually the policeman scene. And that was one of my favourite scenes. And um, I used it, that clip, uh, more than twice a year in a talk that I gave to the actors at the Museum of the Moving Image. This is in the 1980s and 90s. So for 10 years, I was showing that clip at two or three times, probably. And... Um, in 1992, Brian Cohen and I curated an exhibition uh, called Mybridge and the Chrono Photographers. And we had one whole wall that was dedicated to what we called the visionaries. That was the visionaries of cinema, the people who were not only not particularly looking to analyse movement through cinematography, uh, but wanted to get, it, get the pictures back on the screen in movement. They had a vision for cinema. And of course, that was Louis Le Prince, and it was also very much William Freeze Green. And um, again, doing some research for that, I, I learned a lot more, obviously. Um, I quizzed Brian quite a lot in those days. <laughs> um, I once said to him, if, if William Freeze Green had just put another two to one gear on his camera, he would have got 10 frames a second. And Brian said, yeah, but he didn't, did he? which was an interesting kind of lesson in, you know, history, I guess. Um, but uh, the reason and my purpose for showing this clip during my talks uh, was to indicate the spirit um, of the underfunded experimenter. Peter's spoken very well about that in Freeze Green's case, um, struggling to achieve motion pictures on a screen in the late 1880s, early 1890s, 
um, and despite what the policeman clip would have us believe failing. Um, for 15 years, I was involved in a project called A Race to Cinema, the Race to Cinema, creating replicas of the proto cinema cameras um, pre Lumiere uh, and also using them. The project was dreamed up uh, and led by my friend, the late uh, collector dealer Gordon Truinard, and funded by Gordon and his wife Christine. More on that later. Now, many inventors in the period 1888 to 1895 tried to take motion picture films and then screen the films. So having got a result with their film cameras, why couldn't they get their film projectors to work? And we'll just touch on that and some other aspects of freeze green that have interested me uh, in the video. If we could roll that, please. Why did they fail to screen their film strips with the same mechanism as their cameras? We know that the Lumieres, for instance, designed a machine that could be both a camera and projector. However, it was also possible to design a film machine that could be a camera but not a projector, which is what Le Prince, Donis Thorpe and Crofts, Marais, Georges Demony, Skladinovsky and others did. Some partly overcame that problem in ingenious ways, but Freeze Green was one of those who didn't. If you don't have a full system, you don't have motion pictures, and you don't have a show. The first bit, getting a camera to make a strip of photos on unperforated film, is not too easy. But putting those photos on a screen in such a way that we believe we are seeing a full record of the actual life seen in motion is very much more difficult without properly registered images. Here is the mechanism of that early camera and the 1889 patent that was more or less the same mechanism. But let's take a look first at the stereoscopic camera designed by Varley and later adopted by Freeze Green. Here they are, side by side. And this is a display of some of Freeze Green's equipment, with the early camera to the left and the stereo camera centre. The book on which the film was based was published in 1948. Now to the magic box. Robert Donat posing with the stereo camera, a replica made for the film. Here's another replica made 20 years ago by Ivan Rose for Gordon Truinard's project, The Race to Cinema. This is that replica and that's me using it to film Gordon. I managed to get three or four pairs of successive frames at about one frame a second. The 3D was nice though. As to the early monoscopic cameras, the replica was also made for the magic box, but they didn't use it. Here's the replica made for the race to cinema. And that's Peter turning the handle. There was another camera that more closely followed the layout of the famous Atent. This is the Race to Cinema replica. I put together a little book about those replicas for targeted promotion. It's not generally available. Now, here's something that's almost unknown. An important aspect of the 1889 master camera patent design was taken up by others later and successfully. This machine used a very similar mechanism. This one, almost identical, did too. Both of them appeared in 1896 and both were commercially available. It's an interesting overlooked avenue that I shall be exploring in a month or two on my blog, The Optilog. Please Google it. There are many posts about early cinema. Freeze Green has been remembered with a statue and quite a few plaques. 
uh, in the days before spell check. They got both parts of his name wrong on this one, though it was eventually corrected. And of course there is the monument in Highgate Cemetery proclaiming him the inventor of kinematography. His genius bestowed upon humanity the boon of commercial kinematography of which he was the first inventor and patentee. And then the patent details, but it's wrong. They scrambled the numbers. Peter Domankovich has volunteered to go along with some tipex and sort that out. More importantly, it seems to me, is no mention of the co-inventor whose name is on the patent. Mortimer Evans. What was his role? The clue is in his occupation title. He was a mechanical engineer who designed machines. It was, after all, a machine camera. So where is Mortimer Evans buried? And can we please start a subscription for a monument on his grave and this time maybe get the patent number right? Alan Dent, a film reviewer in 1952, wrote about the scene in which Robert Donat, as the inventor, shows the first film ever made to an audience solely consisting of PC Laurence Olivier in The Dead Watches of the Night. This bewildered Bobby may not vie in history with the same major actor of Oedipus and Richard III and Hotspur and Hamlet, but this does not prevent it from being a little performance of the deepest fascination and perfection. The good chap is struck all of a heap, but there's too much dignity to show it. He's the epitome of humanity, faced with a revelation. His exclamation, but it moved, is positively Galileo-like. He still has, with all, some lingering suspicions about the goings-on of this madly urgent eccentric, who has just dragged him upstairs to see moving pictures on a sheet, the two-minute-long culmination of 15 years' research. And it is only with the good constable's very last statement that we can perceive his ultimate decision not to put the suspicious character under immediate arrest, the statement that comes like a dawn after a night of dubiety, or still more, like his dark lantern that is lighted again. You must be a very happy man, Mr... Minute pause to get the strange gentleman's name right, Mr. Freeze Green. Typhoo T celebrated him in 1971, wearing one of his trademark coloured jackets. In the 80s, this 3D comic book with artwork by the legendary Jack Kirby, no less, even remembered Frederick Varley, as well as Willie, evil flatties battle to stop the invention of 3D imaging. The introduction was written by Robert Donat. If anyone doubts Willie's place in history now, just show him the list of his patents in his book. If he still has doubts, patiently show him the pictures of the inventions and the samples of Willie's films. If he continues to doubt after that, dear reader, shoot him, not with a camera, with a gun. Hello folks, well you just read the title um, that said mentioned Brian Coe, um, I'll just tell one little story. <clears throat> I was Brian's assistant in 1971 uh, on a show that he gave at the National Film Theatre 
Ryan had always given a show called something like How the Movies Began, various versions of that title when he worked with Kodak. Um, and uh, he asked for something very special for this particular show because I told him we had the facility to show it. And that was a, a, a reel from the open road, uh, Claude Freeze Green's film, which of course no one at that time knew anything about at all. Um, I, I could get the original, an original reel from the of Nitrate through the programme planning department. And I knew I could get the projector to run at the required speed. We didn't have to worry about a colour wheel because the Nitrate was tinted red and green alternate frames or blue and red. Um, so we were able to show uh, for the first time in probably, I don't know, 40 years or something, uh, an, an original piece of the open road uh, to the NFT audience. And um, first time I'd seen anything like that, of course, I, I, I hadn't even, I don't think, seen Kinema Colour at that point. And it was quite impressive. And we were very pleased to be able to include it. Uh, now, with regard to the surviving apparatus, um, there are other mechanisms that Peter's mentioned um, dating from 1896 onwards. Um, that press switch machine, which I first saw in the 70s, the, the double lens with alternate frames to avoid flicker. Um, John Barnes wasn't very keen on it. He said it was crazy, basically. And I disagree. And I think it was, you have to put yourself back in 1896. And flicker was a real problem. And in fact, Free Screen's friend, Theodore Brown, worked on a similar arrangement quite a few years later with two synchronized GOMOD projectors to do exactly the same thing. And there were other problems other than um, the complexity of making it work, but it was, a, it was a good stab at something that really could have, could have taken off. So I've got a lot of respect for that. Um, incidentally, the replica of the stereo camera that was made for the Magic Box uh, is in the Science Museum collection. They didn't know it was, 20 years ago but when i went to have a look at the original they typed in freeze green stereo camera and a number came up and the man went into a cup and brought it out and i said this isn't it and then we realized what it was so i was able to play around with that replica i don't know whether they had the replica of the other camera that was made for the magic box um, now with regard to the race to cinema collection the cameras were made by engineer ivan rose and most of the sequences were shot by Ivan or by specialist cinematographer, John Adderley. I, pr I provided historical technical information and wrote up some of the details and conversed consistently with the engineer. <clears throat> There's an excellent website, The Race to Cinema, by Jeffrey Cousins, who also um, produced uh, a much bigger book than the little one you saw there, uh, a 12 inch square photo book of all of the replica cameras that were in that collection. And it's gorgeous. And if you go to blurb.com, search for Race to Cinema there and you'll find it. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. That, that was fascinating. I'm sure there'll be some questions um, about that at the end. Um, perhaps a very quick one. Where is the Race to Cinema collection now, the, the cameras that were made? Okay, I'm sorry. I, okay, I better put that to you later because I think we've had technical problems in, in getting your answer there. Okay, well, um, I will ask that question at the end again and any other questions that have come up in the feed. But can we now go to uh, Ian Christie? And uh, Ian, perhaps you can um, contextualize some of this a bit more for us. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Nick. And uh, my job, I think, at this point in the event is to um, say a bit about the afterlife, essentially, of, of William Freeze Green. 
And of course, you know the story by now. Um, you know how the Magic Box in 1951, the great festival of Britain film, was uh, a climax of veneration of Freeze Green. But at the same time, it was also, in a sense, the death knell for his reputation. And um, that's what I'm going to talk about, really, the fate of his reputation. The premiere was a huge event. Um, everybody who was anybody was either in the film or at the premiere. It was really a, a really important part of the Festival of Britain um, celebrations. It was, the, it was the collective tribute of the British film industry to the man that, Almost everybody in Britain, really, believed had invented cinema, film, but had been robbed of the recognition for what he'd done. And there was a strong sense of grievance and injustice that echoes through um, all the um, statements of the tributes to Freeze Green, really right across the, well, the interwar period, um, you know, really from his death. Uh, at the beginning of the 20s, right through the 20s and the 30s. And here's Britain emerging from World War II and proving that really it was Willie Fries Green what done it. Uh, there's a wonderful pate newsreel of the Queen Mother. Well, she was then the Queen, of course. We might see as the Queen Mother um, viewing that strip of stereo film with John Bolting holding it up um, to... Um, for her inspection and explaining what's going on. You've seen, um, there's been a lot of reference to the, the climactic scene in The Magic Box where Laurence Olivier, who was only available for a very short time during the shoot, we know, but plays the bewildered copper, um, the first spectator, as it were, to perfection. It's, it's a very, very touching scene. And you won't be surprised to know that Magic Box is one of Martin Scorsese's um, you know, key fetish films. Uh, probably the reason why he ended up making Hugo a chance to actually revisit that era and insert himself into it. The reaction in Britain was good. It wasn't a commercial hit, but it was good. The reaction across the Atlantic was not so favorable. I think the most restrained review was probably Bosley Crowther in the New York Times, where he describes it uh, rather condescendingly as a generous attempt to pay tribute to an almost forgotten Englishman, one of the many experimenters of motion pictures, uh, etc. And, you know, it's actually, that's pretty fair. <laughs> that's a, quite a good description of it, except that the film is claiming something a bit bigger because of being based on Ray Alistair, his um, uh, Muriel Forth's um, biography. Others in America were not so kind. The, the great American film historian and ex-trade journal uh, editor, Terry Ramsey, denounced the film as a romantic fabrication. And in the Motion Picture Herald uh, in 1951, he said it was a perversion of history, a tragedy of confusions for the tradition of the art. And then things really escalate because all the British supporters of the film, including people who made it, Michael Balkan, John Bolting, Ronnie Neen, all weigh in and say, to acknowledge the efforts of our own RAF in the last war does not imply a refusal to recognize the contribution of the US Army Air Corps. How did they come in on it? In the same way, our tribute to Freeze Green does not blind us to the achievements of many others, including Mr. Edison. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's about the state of tension that was uh, present. And of course, there had been an Anglo-American film war only a few years earlier. So people were, you know, quite wound up to a sense of um, was Britain being done down by America. And this is something very interesting, shows you how this uh, issue had really come into the, the kind of public consciousness at this time. It was Stephen Herbert who brought this to my attention. And um, Stephen sent me this, this wonderful ad from Punch in June, 1952. That's why the film is still in release. Uh, it's not an ad for anything to do with cinema. It's an ad for a paper company. But what they've commissioned is a really rather fine illustration of not William Freeze Green, but Robert Paul. Robert Paul projecting a film in Hatton Garden in 1895. Well, it was an interesting extrapolation. It was Robert Paul, yes, as I'll explain in a moment. But projecting a film in 1895? No. So things were getting a bit 
tangled at this point. Let me try and explain how. And let me explain what really happened in 18, early 1895. And I'm doing this um, with uh, the aid of a, a graphic novel, which uh, I co-produced during the celebration of Robert Paul's 150th anniversary in 2019. And um, what we've done in the graphic novel is to visualize that scene, which incidentally Peter Domankiewicz has rather wonderfully um, recreated in one of his uh, presentations. What actually happened when Bert Akers and Robert Paul decided to shoot their test film? He went to Barnet, that's where Bert Akers lived. They had Henry Short, the man who had brought them together there, dressed in his cricket whites, going past the front of Bert Akers' house. They film it with their camera. They go back to Hatton Garden, Robert Paul's workshop. They develop it. They put it into a kinetoscope, of course. It has to be a kinetoscope because that's what Robert Paul is making and that's the only system that's available. They're shooting a film for a kinetoscope. Uh, it works. And what we did in the graphic novel is we tried to imagine that scene. And we know for a fact that, yes, the police did hear the noise that was being kicked up in Hatton Garden, pretty quiet place normally at that time of night, as they watched their film run. We had made such a cheering over our success that the police came in to know what was the matter. Now, one of the things we've done, by the way, in this, and this is another story, really, but we've, we've assumed, I think very plausibly, that both Robert Paul and Bert Akers, who were to fall out in a big way <laughs> within a few months of this, we assumed they were both there, because why would they not be? Bert Akers was as interested as Robert Paul to see that the film they'd shot together in Barnet uh, was running successfully, and it was. How do we know this is what happened? Well, this is the most, uh, this is the earliest account of it in print that I have found. Uh, it's a report from the Kinney Weekly, uh, January 1909. Robert Paul is by this time a very senior figure in the British film industry. In fact, he's about to leave it, but I don't think he knows that in the room. And he's been chairman. Uh, acting chairman of many of these tra big trade meetings of the Kinematograph Manufacturers Association. The rest, the, the council chamber of the Hoban restaurant was well filled. This is the account of that meeting where Paul is reported as saying it was the time when they had to punch 16 holes in one impression. You had to punch your sprocket holes at that time. It was 3 a.m. in the morning. They'd successfully finished their film. They'd made such a cheering that the police came in to know what was the matter. Now, everybody in that room probably would have known this story. It wasn't by any means an unknown story. And certainly nobody was demurring that it had happened to Robert Paul because he was the, he and Bert Akers uh, were the pioneers in early 1895 in Britain. What goes wrong <laughs> with the transmission of this story? How does it get transferred to um, William Freeze Green? Well, of course it doesn't happen during his lifetime. It happens immediately after his death. And the, the culprit, and I think we have to say culprit here, was Will Day. Will Day, there's a plaque commemorating him as cinema historian, etc., etc., etc. Incidentally, that's put up by the Anima Masonic Lodge. It turns out that uh, Will Day was a great mason and he hoped to create a sort of special lodge of the masons for the film industry. I don't know if that took off. He was also a radio pioneer and his actual business was to run a radio spares and repair shop, which you see there on the right. Peter Devankovitz has found the evidence that Will Day was putting out stories about Freeze Green within a day or two of his death. And he seems to have been the main promoter, the main publicist of the story that basically Willie Freeze Green had done it all. And that story is spread far and wide. Now, I'm going to jump forward a little bit. I think somebody who played a part in the transmission of this story was um, a popular film historian called Leslie Wood, uh, who wrote a couple of books, which would have been the kind of books that many people would have read. These are books aimed at the general public. They're very lively, very well written. He was an extremely well-connected film journalist. And in his first book in 1937, Romance of the Movies, he manages to combine <laughs> the two stories. <laughs> Um, 
the story of Willy Fries Green supposedly um, inviting the policeman in and the story of Paul showing him what he had done to the policeman. And this is what he writes in his book. A police constable saw Fries Green's world's premiere of the moving picture. And it was a police constable who saw the world's premiere of the first perfect movie. Hmm. True, the picture still flickered, etc., etc., etc. But at last, the moving picture, as we know it today, had arrived. <laughs> you, I often wonder what was going through Leslie Wood's mind. He hadn't known Fries Green, I think, at all, uh, but he had known uh, William uh, Robert Paul, and he'd interviewed him. And it's very convincing. He'd obviously gone along to see him, and he got it straight from the man's mouth. Did they talk about Fries Green at the time? Did they have a conversation, perhaps, about why does everybody think it was Freeze Green? We don't know. Nothing is written about that. And uh, Leslie Wood tells the story again in a post-war book, Miracle of the Movies. Now, as you know, at this point, uh, Ray Allister, uh, this fourth, had published her book. The film had been made. There'd been all that controversy. And here's a later account really after Brian Coe had intervened into the story. And I'll just quote here, an antidote to this biography, that's a close-up of an inventor, is a scholarly study by Brian Coe, William Fries Green at the Origins of Cinematography, published in 1969 in the British Film Institute's Screen. It's based on an extensive search of the contemporary photographic journals by an acknowledged expert in the history of early cinema. Well, Brian Coe was as much an expert as anybody at that time. There weren't that many experts, and he was certainly well accredited uh, and well respected, and Stephen has talked about the, the shows that he did. Now, we move into the period after this, everybody, in a sense, drops Freeze Green. I mean, you can hear the sound of Freeze Green being dropped from a great height after Brian Coe's demolition job in the 1960s. And the next stage in the history of the writing of early British cinema is essentially John Barnes's intervention with the first edition of his book, The Beginnings of the Cinema in England, which was published by a small provincial publisher. And I don't think it attracted a huge amount of attention at the time. Uh, John was respected by those who knew him, and he was determined to get it right in a very fundamental, first-hand, uh, I'm going to find the documents way. The book then is republished eventually, much later, in 1998, when John has completed his set of five, covering the first, the opening years of the cinema in England. And by this time, John Barnes is highly respected and his work is well known. But I think it's fair to say that John was not especially interested in William Fries Green. You get a sort of sense that Fries Green gets in the way of telling the true story. And the true story is really the battle between Bert Akers and Robert Paul, and their, their somewhat divergent accounts of what really happened in 1895. So William Fries Green has become a kind of adjunct and, and a bit of an irritation, I think it's fair to say, in, in that account. And let's just jump on for a moment to uh, a very interesting book published by Michael Channon, a filmmaker like, like Peter uh, Domankiewicz and also a scholar, who publishes a really interesting revisionist account of the beginnings of cinema in 1980. It's called The Dream That Kicks, a quote from Dylan Thomas. And it was the first post Brian Coe attempt to play fair by Willie Fries Green. And it makes a very convincing claim for Fries Green's real achievements. It, it takes issue with Brian Coe and says, look, Coe didn't get it right. If we look at the actual documents, if we look at what, what uh, Fries Green did do, you get a very different picture. Meanwhile, another very important figure in this story, the, the curator of instruments at the Cinémathèque Française, Laurent Manoni, publishes his very impressive book, The Great Art of Light and Shadow, later translated by Richard Krangel of the Magic Lantern Society. And actually, if you look up Willy Fries Green in Laurent's book, he gets everything wrong. He's just not interested in Freeze Green, and he gets the dates of everything, of even of the magic box, completely wrong in the first edition of his book. It's, it's, Freeze Green has become a nuisance. So where are we today? Well, 
there's a great process of reassessing freeze green, which I think is, is exceptionally welcome. And I think I've summarized the points here. You know, we're less mesmerized by who did what first. We have a number of books out in the field, a number of studies, which stress that this was not a solo endeavor. And deciding who was first with anything depends what you think they did and what you are looking for as done for the first time. We're much more interested today, and rightly so, in the variety of invention that preceded Lumiere uh, and Akers and Paul and Laust and the Lathams and Dixon and many, many others. And I think we should remember Henry Hopwood's advice in a book which was published actually in 1899. And this is the epigraph to Laurent Manoni's book, by the way, in English. No, emphatically, no, there is not. There never was an inventor, an inventor of the living picture. Right. But, and I'm just going to have a brief coda here, but it's an important pair of buts. There are a few outstanding charges against Freeze Green, I think, quite apart from what he contributed to the, the invention phase of moving pictures. And I think these do have some bearing on the esteem or in some cases lack of esteem that he's held in today. The first is that he was willing to testify in 1910 for Edison, supporting Edison's efforts to bully his rivals into submission with the Motion Picture Patents Company. Edison wanted Freeze Green to step up and testify in a very protracted series of court cases he was having to prove that he had the right to claim all the patents in cinema. And that would deal a death blow in many ways to European cooperation. It had a huge effect on the development of cinema. And Willie Freeze Green, decidedly short of money at this stage, was stepped in and I think was probably glad for the recognition by Edison, even if he was actually supporting something that was uh, ultimately very unfortunate. And the second charge, and this really does rankle with some people I know, he, Freeze Green was, as I think Peter has already mentioned, extremely interested in the development of color, uh, color film, color photography, uh, and, you know, was a, a major figure in it in the early uh, 1900s. He embarked on a long-running legal battle to validate his biocolor process against Charles Urban and G.A. Smith's kinema color. But, and this lasted for a long time, between 1911 and 1914. Uh, he was supported, by the way, uh, Willie, who had no money, of course, but supported by a rather rich and eccentric figure in Brighton who got invested in the campaign to, to validate biocolor and to do down the patent for kinema color, which Urban was at this time very successfully exploiting. And Urban had a huge network, not only in Britain, but also internationally, of kinema color uh, franchisees who were showing kinema color and films were being made. There was a big production program. When the case came to appeal in 1914, the validity of Urban's um, patent was struck down. And at, in a moment, his business collapsed. Um, and many, there are a number of people, I think, who feel that Freeze Green uh, was responsible for that by pursuing his campaign to validate biocolor against Kinemacolor. And I think those are two of the reasons, in addition to the completely misguided flag waving of the interwar years, which Freeze Green himself had nothing to do with, of course, but I think those two factors probably account for the fact that Freeze Green still has a bad reputation in some corners of the early cinema research field. But at the same time, they make him an absolutely prime case for serious revaluation, which I, I know is something that Peter is determined to do and has been doing for some time. And I think the work that he's going to embark on, funded at last, is going to be a big help. And if you're really interested in this field and getting deeper into it, uh, can I just advertise a symposium that we are doing at Birkbeck, the 26th and 27th of May, entirely online. You can sign up for it. And you will hear many of the um, people you're hearing tonight and a lot of others talking about these issues and you'll have a chance to join in. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much for those three quite different presentations. I think um, sharing passion and, and fascination for the subject, but presenting it in, in different ways. Um, I'd like to go now, if we could, to uh, can we have all of the speakers on screen with me, and then we can we can uh, perhaps have a discussion. Okay. So I have some questions which I've got from the YouTube feed, but um, as is uh, as is traditional, I will ask the first question. I'll take take the first uh, case here. I want to go back to this idea of the father of cinema because the, the, the idea of the father of cinema suggests a lineage. And we're, we're looking at the um, at 100 candidates here. Sorry, can I we're looking at a hundredth anniversary here, but there've been lots of other anniversaries in the in, in the history of uh, projected moving pictures. There was the fortieth anniversary in thirty-six. There was the sixtieth anniversary in fifty-seven. All the way up to the hundredth anniversary, which I remember we celebrated in nineteen ninety-five, ninety-six, and they all had something in common right up to the hundredth anniversary, which is they were all about how we got to now. It was all about who invented the parts of the moving picture cameras that we still use and the projectors that we still use. And I think that that's an important reason that people like Edison are, are very much celebrated because right up until the 100th anniversary, you could take apart a projector and you could say who invented the different bits of it. And none of that would be Freeze Green. So Freeze Green's not in that technical story. And so he gets kind of squeezed out along with a lot of other inventors who, um, who are not still present in technology. But now, the way that we experience moving pictures, there's nothing of Edison in there. There's nothing of, of Lumiere in there. There's no Skladanovsky. So in a sense, all these technical inventors, or these inventors of, of technical processes and machines are now it's not a story of how we got to now. It's, it's a quite different story. And I wonder if um, we need a new kind of group history of the invention of moving pictures, which looks more at a group of inventors conscious of each other's work, who are all contributing in some way to the sense that moving images are important, that they're going to come. And, and somehow if we look at that, um, uh, 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 as Ian was saying, that, that group of people, rather than seeing them as in competition and as somehow having this, this uh, paternal relationship to the father of the medium. And I, I came across the other day, uh, Frank Gray, who's the film historian and archivist, said that Freeze Green contributed to the invention of the idea of cinema. Yeah. And I wonder, I wonder if that's a way forward now to get away from trying to, to kind of battle these inventors against each other and say they're all part of something important, which is about the idea of the moving image, as opposed to the technology to produce it. I don't know if any of you want to jump in there. Can I just say, I totally agree with that, Nick. It's something that was discussed a lot during the centenary, 95, 96. Um, we don't seem to have progressed very much in that direction since then. I mean, I always used to say they were helping each other, they were hindering, they were stealing stuff from each other. They mostly knew what was going, mostly not entirely knew what was going on. They kept an eye on the patents, sometimes maybe even had agents telling them. So there was a lot of that going on. And it is a complete story. The, the, the problem is there are linear developments, linear technical developments, but there are lots of them. And they're not single lines. And so actually, it makes more sense to have an overview. And I've tried to do that. In the work. I mean, I have, you know, I wrote a book about one other inventor who failed, words with Donisol. But I tried to put it in context with everyone. And I wasn't saying, you know, he was the father of kinesigraphy or whatever he would have called it. I was saying he's one of these characters we need to look at because we need to look at them all. Um, but uh, it just it, it is, I, I think we're the last people who are going to be interested in the details of the technology, to be honest. <laughs> you know, we, we, we're the last analog generation, you know, the analog generation. And I just don't think anyone's not even, not only not interested, they just won't get it 
get why we were. You know, like it, I think, yeah, yeah, Ian. <laughs> Well, Can I just, uh, sorry, Ian. Just, just one comment on what you just said, Stephen. Um, I know what you mean, but actually what I have to say that when I show bits of apparatus to young people, they're absolutely fascinated by it. Yeah. Precisely because they live in a non-apparatus yeah. world. But that's you and me and Peter and Nick and 10 other people in the world. And I don't think we're winning. <laughs> I mean, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I think I think there's also the point that if you pull your iPhone apart, you won't be able to understand how it works. But the pieces of equipment that, that you're yeah. showing to your students, there's, yeah. a, there's a possibility that they'll understand some of the principles. Can I ask, Peter, can I ask you a question about this? Because yeah. you, you interested me by saying that the freeze ring didn't work in secret. Whereas there were other inventors who, who who were keeping their their work secret, does does that go against this idea of a of a group of of technical inventors who are moving towards a shared goal? Um, are some moving faster than others? Are some outside the group because they're working secret? Well, some are. Well, there's two things. Um, in in terms of secrecy, or or sharing of things, I, I, I'm constantly looking at influence when I'm looking at the history of moving pictures, because there's some really, really interesting people, but they were just kind of working away in a corner. John Rudge, for instance, was up to really interesting stuff. The only reason we know about it is because Freeze Green met him, went to London and talked about him and took things up there. And that's why we know about him today. If that hadn't happened, he would have just been a guy working in Bath and who people in Bath talked about. And it, and it never would have rolled out any further. And he never would have been talked about in another country or anything like that. Edward Moybridge, who did all his, you know, is famous for his capturing animals' emotions and running horses and all of that. I think the single most important thing he actually did was getting a piece of basically old technology at that moment. This is Zupraxiscope projection. It wasn't using a new idea, but with it, he was able to show, even though they were just silhouettes, especially drawn, how motion really looked. And because he went around to different countries and he gave lectures to thousands upon thousands and thousands of people. You know, in those audiences of people who went away and go, wouldn't it be amazing if you could do that and it didn't just repeat and repeat, but it just went on and you could just film anything? Wouldn't that be amazing? And that's a huge influence. If he'd just taken those pictures, published a book, I don't think it would have been the same. So I think influence is a very important part of it. And also, there's simply accidents. I mean, something I've written about in my blog. There were two points in the first year of like projecting motion pictures before the industry really kicked off, where we could have had widescreen. The people who, there's a group called the Lambda Company invented the idoloscope. They decided to go for widescreen, not the square type of pictures we think of from silent cinema. But they were not a successful company. I reckon they could have made a go of it with the right backing, but they didn't have the backing of somebody like Edison. They really messed it up. And then, just as Edison was launching his Vitascope, which was, in fact, invented by somebody else entirely, the people who were backing it, Raff and Gammon, said, look, our, the people we're, the people, you know, we're selling to, the theatres, they want a more widescreen picture. And Armat, who was working with it, said, well, there's no time. We've got to get in there quick, basically, before the Lumiere's come. We'll do that later. So by a weird accident of fate, we waited decades for widescreen to come. So there's all sorts of things that feed into this. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Can I ask a, a, a question that's come from the, the YouTube feed as well? We're uh, from, from actually from John <coughs> Freeze Green, who's uh, uh, William Freeze Green's great grandson, who's uh, interested in two things. One of them is this question of where Freeze Green, Green's surviving cameras are now. Or perhaps I should say what survives and, and where they are. Uh, and the other question that he has is is it correct that Freeze Green achieved? Um, six frames per second, um, but it was not deemed enough for a viable moving picture. Is that, um, can, can you answer the first one, Stephen, about what survives and where they are? Yeah, um, the stereoscopic camera, which was obviously in association with Varley, that's in the Science Museum collection. Its physical location is probably Bradford, and it may or may not be on display at any particular time, but it survives. The um, the main machine that he made with Prestwich, the interesting double projector, 
that's um, that also survives. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's in the Science Museum collection now as well. Um, there are two very interesting mechanisms. I had a call in the 90s from the curator of uh, Kingston Museum because I was then working on my bridge there, as I am still today. And he said, we've got a couple of old trajectory things that have turned up in the store. We're digging through. And they're supposed to have had something to do with freeze green. Anyway, I whizzed down there and I recognised them immediately because they're the two mechanisms that are shown in um, Close Up of an Inventor. And in fact, one of them is shown, is used as a, as a prop, uh, seems, you know, prop uh, in, in the magic box. So they were made by Leger Company, probably 1896. And um, I let Peter know, and he whizzed off and had a look, and John Barnes whizzed off and had a look. And um, they do tie up with some, some patent ideas from 1896, 35 millimeter perforated film, there they are. Um, <laughs> and we actually put them on display at Kingston, at one end of the Mybridge Gallery uh, at that time, but they weren't there for very long, and they went back in store, and I've not seen them since. But um, uh, that's, they're, they're interesting survivors. <laughs> They're interesting survivors. Um, I've got the uh, the later one as well. Oh, shall we? <laughs> we all we all, we all been away by um, uh, so, so there are so there are those two mechanisms. I think Peter, you're probably aware there's a uh, another little projector that's in the uh, Paris um, collection. I think that's associated with freeze green. The the one that he was probably doing color yeah experiments with, with yeah. yeah which is which is. But it, well, well, they say it's a wrench projector. I don't know. This well, is one of the things well, I'll get round to in my PhD. You know, I think it's, uh, it's yeah, absolutely. It's 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 obviously something that one of the companies has made, but it's something that he was experimenting with adapting. So it's definitely important. one of the most frustrating things for me is there was yeah. a picture that Stephen showed of a bunch of equipment on a table. Yeah, that was taken in 1909. Yeah, like where did the other things go? Well, one suggestion that. Nick turned up a few weeks ago, and it's quite an interesting story. I know that it's been discounted since and stuff, but I still think it's a great story. <laughs> oh, yes. And it was a visitor to the set of um, The Magic Box. He went with Ray Allister, I think, or met Ray Allister there. And he said that he knew where the big, important original camera was, the camera that, you know, you see freeze green carrying, <laughs> excuse me, and he said it was sent to America um, with two engineers or something like that um, uh, on a ship called the Titanic. So um, it's not impossible. I still say it's not impossible. We need to look at those that passenger list yeah. and just check <laughs> how many engineers were on it because it does disappear very quickly at roughly that time. Theodore Brown had it for a while. He said, you know, he said he had it and. Then he, then he obviously gave it back because he wouldn't have nicked it for his friend. And then a couple of years later, it's, it's gone. And no one says anything about it ever again. Yeah. And, but, and it's, um, you know, it's rather wonderful to think that it might still exist, even if it's a bit soggy. Yeah. Can I, can I, can I just, I mean, that, that, I mean, it's a story. Who knows? I, 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 maybe I'll look at that passenger manifest. But there is another possibility, which is, and I have to make a correction here, um, right. which is when Freeze Green went to America in 1910 to testify, he was not testifying for Edison, he was testifying against him. He, no. he, was, yes. he, was, he was brought over by the, by the independents, the group who were fighting the Edison monopoly. Uh, that's a whole story. People say one thing, people say another. It's one of the things I'll be looking at. It does, unfortunately, it's one of those typical things that's not cut and dried. He went, probably hoping he would be proved the inventor of moving pictures. But of course, court cases are far more complex. He did, he did um, certainly contribute to the moving picture patents company backing down and dropping a load of injunctions suddenly yeah. and with no explanation after his testimony was submitted. And later on, believe it or not, a very important patent called the Latham Loop, which is little things in every projector and in a lot of cameras, which is a little bit of loose film, which is pulled down. The reason for that is if you don't, you're pulling straight on a big reel of film and it's a lot of weight to pull against. That was in the Freeze Green Evans first patent in 1889. But it took 
a smart lawyer in a case after years of cases have been fought to spot it and go, wait a minute. And once that came up, the Latham patent was struck down as no longer being valid. Can I say something about that, Peter? Yes. If you don't have a sprocket with a sprocket guard above the gate, the loop doesn't do anything useful. It doesn't work because your bounce still goes on to, from your feed spool. You still get a bouncy feed spool. That's the problem with the results we got with the freeze green cameras when they were tested. So it's the Latham loop. You see, when when um, I won't go into too much detail about loops and flickers and sprockets and shutters. Don't know. <laughs> but basically, when those guys like Jenkins were giving the first shows, you know, September 95 in America, they had to physically keep turning the top spool around with their finger to stop yeah. that weight. Well, the Latham loop, yeah, it works, but only if you put that top sprocket on. And, you, and, and free screen's camera hasn't got that. So, but he did mention the loop, which is good, because if you try to do it really tight, you're going to rip the film anyway. So he recognised that some slack was necessary. But actually, from a technical point of view, it's not the same as the Latham loop. That's, that's my... Sort of, you know, it off the peg, sort of off the off the cuff, sort of take take on that. But um, it, I'll, I, I, I'm interested to have another look. Can I? Am I speaking out of turn? I'm talking too much, aren't I? Can I say one more thing? Then it's to yes, do with that camera. It's to do with that camera, and it came to me this week. I just two things. So I had two epiphany moments. Okay, this week about that 1889 patent. First of all, I realised why, for the last 50 years, it seemed familiar to me. I suddenly, the mechanism, the, the principle behind it, it suddenly occurred to me. The second thing that came to me today, which is I realized where that already existed in technology in 1889, and where Mortimer Evans got it from. Maybe. <laughs> or really Free Screen got it from. So we're probably arguing about that. But I'm writing that up as part of that article that I mentioned about those other two machines. Are you going to say it's from a Meccano motor? No. 1914, <laughs> Frank Horn. Too late. I had to consider that, consider that. I consider that because I have got several Meccano motors, as you may have guessed. But it's well, 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 could I do, can I just comment on something? That, uh, sorry. Yeah, Stephen's, had chance, Stephen's had a chance to trail his blog, and Peter's trailed his PhD thesis, even though it's... Uh, no, no, this, uh, this is not me trailing my blog. I think... Uh, although although we, we, Ian, we give Ian some space. Sorry, what but do you just, want? As Peter rightly said, and I, I just passed over this very quickly, when Freeze Green was summoned to testify in the case in America, it's true that he was, of course, not called by Edison to testify. But, but it's not, and it's equally true, it's not a cut and dried matter. Um, and, and I think that there's a, a kind of climate of suspicion has swirled around Freeze Green because of that incident, because of his role in suddenly appearing in 1910 in that very contentious climate. Likewise, his role in the urban Kenna affair. By, by, it's, it's quite difficult to sort out. But something which Peter said to me a long time ago, earlier in my researches, which really struck me as really important, is that you know Edison was very conscious of the freeze green patent throughout his work, the development period of what became the, the kinetoscope and the kinetograph. And uh, one hypothesis, and I think it's Peter's hypothesis, I'll just quote it, you can tell me if I've got it right, is that possibly the reason why Edison did not extend his patent or the kinetoscope outside of the US was because of fear of infringing a prior patent, which might have been freeze greens. And if that is even plausible or true, it's hugely important for the development of the moving picture business outside of America and across the world, in fact. So that would be the biggest influence that Freeze Green's pioneering work might have had. Not the practicality of what he no. built or didn't build, but the sheer, the, the sheer um, foresight of his patent which takes us back to the zeitgeist aspect of all of this. The reason what we're really talking about is a zeitgeist. Yeah. The Germans have a wonderful word for it. The belief that moving pictures were entirely possible. We're almost there yeah. before they were there. Oh, yeah. And he was working towards it. Hmm. Interesting. Thank, thank you very much. I think that, that uh, along with the 
that wonderful image of touching the eyes of the the the, the figure on the screen that the magic of the image as well as the magic of the the machinery that produced the image i mean that's that, that's so fascinating to me particularly and i would i would, I would hope that that continues to inspire film students and uh, and film researchers for many years. We're really coming to the end of our time. Um, I'd like to do two things. I'd like to uh, certainly thank our three speakers who um, for, for, for sharing their passion for free screen with us this evening. And I'd like to thank Kennington Bioscope for inviting us along. And also to the people who've contributed to the comments in the in the live feed. There's a lot of interesting stuff to read there. And uh, I would I, I'd suggest that you, you go and do that. But um, if this was a live event, we'd all go to the pub and this would continue for another couple of hours. But sadly, uh, we're going to have to, um, to say goodbye and, uh, and thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye bye. bye. Baby, did I do? Do you love me, baby? Sure, I love her, baby. Precious baby, did I do?